of the incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Look at verse 9. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, yet his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. Look at verse 14, and we'll finish our reading. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. I pray, Lord, while we share your word, that the Spirit of God would breathe life into us. Lord, I pray that the true meaning, the joy of Christmas, would well up from deep within our spirits in Jesus' name to ask the disciples, who do people say that I am? The disciples answered, some people say you are John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Others say you are Elijah or Jeremiah or another prophet. Truth is, people were saying a lot more than that about Jesus. Some people said he was a teacher. Some people said he was a blasphemer. Some people said he was a sorcerer. Some people said he was an opportunist. His own family said that he was nuts. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. Jesus has always been controversial. And he always will be controversial to the end. Jesus said, they hated me without reason, and they'll hate you because of me. He said, if I hadn't come and spoken the truth to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse. Then Jesus asked the disciples, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Beloved, can I tell you that that is life's ultimate question. Who is Jesus? The answer to that question is the key to an abundant life here on earth, and it's the key to eternal life in heaven. One day, every one of us will stand before God, and our eternal destiny will be determined on the basis, basis of how we answered that one question, who is Jesus? The Bible says one day everyone will know the right answer. One day there will come a moment when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The evil dictators of the world will one day bow their knee before Jesus Christ. Corrupt politicians and pundits, the blind leaders of the blind, the imams of Islam, the gurus in India, the priests in Asia, the witch doctors in Africa, the stars in Hollywood will one day bow their knees and confess Jesus is Lord. But then it will be too late to be convinced about Jesus. Our window to answer that question will be closed. Many people have decided to reject Jesus. We know that but many others remain undecided about him. And many remain indifferent about making a decision on Jesus. But beloved, listen to me. The decision not to make a decision is a decision. The decision not to receive Jesus now is the decision ultimately to reject him for all of eternity. Peter speaks up and he makes his famous confession of faith. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're blessed, Peter, because man has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. 
Now the question is in front of each one of us. Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? My prayer is that you will shut out every other voice but the voice of God. And that as we look at the scriptures together, you'll receive not information about Jesus, but you'll receive a revelation in your heart of who he is. Who do you say that I am? There is no better place to look for the answer to that question than the opening lines of the Gospel of John. These are some of the most powerfully poetic lines in the entire Bible. Many people believe that these verses are actually the lyrics to a hymn of the early church, the hymn of the Incarnation. And as I look at this hymn of the Incarnation, I see five things that it reveals about Jesus And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Five things that the hymn of the incarnation reveals about Jesus. First of all, this. Jesus has always existed. In the beginning was the word. That Greek verb for was is in a continuous past tense. It's a statement of continuous being. Somebody explained it this way. It means that Jesus always was wasing. The meaning of that opening line is before the beginning began, Jesus was. Before time began, Jesus was. Before the universe was made, Jesus was. Before the world was created, Jesus was. Before God formed mankind out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul, Jesus was. Before human history began, Jesus was. You know, I don't have any problem at all with the Big Bang Theory. You know, the Big Bang Theory is in the Bible. In Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Bang! (laughs) You know, you can keep adding billions and billions of years to your story. But if you remove God from the equation, you are at a total loss to explain the origin of the universe or of mankind. Life was created when an electrical charge happened in a primordial soup of elements and minerals. All right, who made the soup? (laughs) Where'd the electrical charges come from? You know, modern science has proven beyond question that the universe had a beginning, and that only goes to reinforce the story of creation because everything that had a beginning must have a source. And John 1, 3 tells us who is the source. It all came from Jesus. Through him, all things came into being, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. Some of the punch of these opening verses of John are lost a little bit in translation into English. But in Greek, John makes a very deliberate change in his verbs between verse 1 and verse 3. The word always was, but the things that he made came into being. He was always here, but time was not always here. He was always here, but the world was not always here. He was always here, but we were not always here. John is telling us vital things about Jesus here. One thing he's telling us is that Jesus is eternal. He had no beginning and he shall have no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He has always been and he shall always be. Second, John is telling us very clearly that Jesus is not himself a created being. Beloved, listen, Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is not his own special class of created being. Jesus was not created by the Father. He was always alongside of the Father. An erroneous view of Jesus is that God created Jesus and then Jesus created everything else. That's the teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others, but it's not what the Bible says. He always was, and he created everything that is. The third thing that John is telling us is that we, on the other hand, we are created beings. We were created by Jesus. 
in the beginning was the Word. Five things that the hymn of the Incarnation reveals about Jesus. Number two, Jesus is distinct from the Father and bound in a perfect relationship with Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The word was with God means that he was alongside of God. Again, it, it's a past continuous verb. He was always alongside of God. There was never a time that Jesus was not alongside of God. The Greek words literally mean that Jesus was face to face with God. Actually, it's a very provocative expression. It, it talks about two people coming together for intimacy. So with these words, John is telling us some vital things about the Trinity. First, God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit exist eternally distinct from one another. They are three distinct persons that comprise one triune Godhead. That's an important point in Christian theology. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not three gods on the one hand, but neither are they three modes of God on the other hand. They are three distinct persons who are co-equally and co-eternally God. The second thing that this tells us about the Trinity is that the three persons of the Godhead exist in intimate, unbroken fellowship with one another. That's something that Jesus talks about often in the Gospel of John. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and we have fellowship with one another. And there's something important for you and I to realize when we realize the, the bond, the fellowship of the Godhead. Beloved, God did not create us because he needed our fellowship. God was not lonely. God is perfectly complete in himself. He exists in a perfect circle of fellowship. He exists in a perfect circle of love. God is all the company that God has ever needed. He is a complete party of three. And if he had never created us, it would have in no way diminished his divine fulfillment. But God did create us. And he created us for his glory. Amen. He created us to bring him pleasure. He created us to be the objects of his love. That is our primary purpose. And we function best in life when we stick to our primary purpose. My in-laws just arrived from Canada yesterday for Christmas, and my father-in-law has this old kitchen knife that he always brings with him when he comes for the holidays. It's about 40 years old. He grew up on a farm, so he knows how to sharpen a knife like a razor, and he always brings his old kitchen knife to our house for the holidays because our knives couldn't cut through warm butter. And he guards this knife with his life. It has a wooden handle, and one year I put it in the dishwasher. I was almost disowned from the family. <laughs> and the knife cuts beautifully, but the, about a third, it's a big old butcher's knife, and a, a, the tip and about a third of the blade is missing from the end of the knife. So I asked my father-in-law one day, I said, Dad, what happened to your knife? And he said, oh, I used to use that knife for everything. I used to pry things open with it. I used to use it as a screwdriver. I used to open packages with it. And one day, I broke the tip off of it. See, the knife works beautifully as a knife, but not so much as a crowbar. <laughs> you know, that's just the same with you and with me. We were created by God to give God glory. Yes. We were created to worship him. We were created to glorify him by giving full expression to the image of God that is inside of us. So when I create, I'm giving glory to God and bringing him pleasure. When I excel at whatever it is I'm doing, I'm giving glory to God and bringing him pleasure. I love the movie Chariots of Fire. It tells the story of Olympic gold medalist and Christian missionary Eric Little. 
And one of the great lines in the movie is when Eric Little tells his Jewish friend, I, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. We were created to be the objects of God's love. We were created to receive his love, to reciprocate that love back to him. We were created to have his love filling our hearts to overflowing and running out to others. That's what we were made for. And just like dad's old butcher knife, when we do what we're made for, we function beautifully, but we become broken when we apply ourselves to purposes that we were never meant for. And maybe if you've experienced some brokenness in your life, it's because someone was misusing you or because you were using your life, the gifts, the talents, the, the things that God has given you for a purpose other than what God intended. If you want to function the best that you can in life, become a worshiper of God, become a recipient of his love, become a conduit of his love. But you know, here's the awesome thing about Dad's old knife. Since he stopped using it as a crowbar and a screwdriver, it hasn't broken anymore. And it is just as useful and valuable to him as it has ever been. And when you stop you misusing your life, you won't break anymore either. And God wants you to know that you are just as useful and as valuable to him as you have ever been. The Word was with God. And learning something about who Jesus is, we learn something important about who we are too. Five things that the hymn of the Incarnation reveals about Jesus. He has always been. He is distinct from the Father and bound in a perfect love relationship with Him. A third thing that we learn about Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By saying that Jesus has always been face to face with the Father, John has already told us implicitly that Jesus is equal with God, but just in case there is any room for doubt, he makes an explicit statement of Jesus deity the word was God before the beginning began he was always God some important things about Jesus here first of all it doesn't say that Jesus was merely a reflection of God or an image of God he is God it doesn't say he's a man that became God at some point it says he has always been God Neither does it say that Jesus is a God with a little g. It says he is God, the one true God of the Bible. And because he is the creator of the universe and everything in it, he means that it means that he is the one true God for everyone. Beloved, Jesus is not the God of the Western world, while Allah is God of the Middle East, and Buddha is God of the Far East, and Shiva and Vishnu are the gods of the Southeast. Jesus is God for everyone. He's God of the North and of the South and of the East and of the West. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Do you know, that's why John used the title Logos, the word for Jesus. Only John uses that title for Christ in the Gospel of John and in the book of Revelation. Logos, the word, meant one thing to the Greek people that John pastored in the city of Ephesus, and it meant another thing to the Jewish people from whom the Christ came. Actually, in Jesus' day, in the Old Testament copies of the Scripture, because the name of God was too holy to write, everywhere the name of God appeared, they would substitute the title, The Word. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John takes this word, the logos, the word, uh, that's familiar to the Greeks and familiar to the Jews, and he gives it a new meaning as a title for Christ, and the message is this, Jesus, the logos, is God of both the Jews and the Greeks, and the word was God. Jesus is God of all, and he is God for all. 
Five things that the hymn of the incarnation reveals about Jesus. Number four. I like this one. Jesus changed his status. Jesus changed his status. In verse one, John uses that Greek continuous past tense to tell us before the beginning, Jesus always was. But in verse 14, he uses a different verb about Jesus to indicate a change in status. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So John is saying, he who always was before the beginning of time was made to become flesh. In Greek, it literally means he pitched his tent among us. Whom do you say that I am? Jesus is not merely a man who some imagine to be a God. He's not a man that became God, nor is he God that appeared in the apparition of a man. John is saying, listen to my eyewitness testimony about Jesus. He is God who at a strategic moment in human history entered our world in a body of actual human flesh. He is the unique God man without ceasing to be God in any regard Jesus took a human nature into union with his divine nature and he took a human body into union with his divine being in Christ all the fullness of God dwells in a body of human flesh God became something that he previously was not, and forever after the incarnation, God would never be the same again. Beloved, if you think about that, if you chew on that a little bit, it'll make you speak in tongues. Only God could do something like that. You know what? I love Christmas. I love the whole thing. I love the trees. I love the presents. I love giving. I love getting presents. I love my wife's Christmas cookies. I, I, I love family dinner. I love the whole thing. And you know what? If some people get a little wrapped up in the commercialism, what's that to me? Every light I see on every tree reminds me that the Word became flesh, that God changed His status and became something that He previously was not, and He did it just for me. There's a joy in my heart over Christmas that no mall parking lot can take away from me ever. I don't care whether some atheist puts a billboard in Times Square, wants to take Christ out of Christmas. You will never take Christ out of Christmas, and you will never take Christ out of my heart. And because Jesus was not merely a man, his words are not merely the words of a man. They are the Logos, the Word of God. Jesus' words are more than sublimely inspiring. They're more than noble aspirations and lofty ideals. They're more than just good counsel and good suggestion. They are God's words of eternal life. They quicken the dead in spirit. They enlighten the spiritually ignorant. They impart wisdom for life here on earth. And they lead to everlasting life in heaven. Five things that the hymn of the incarnation reveals about Jesus. He always was. He's distinct from the Father and bound in a perfect love relationship with him. Jesus is God. He changed his status. And finally, the last one is this. Jesus is the only one of his kind. Worship team, you can come and help me. Jesus is the only one of his kind. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. Beloved, in the history of the world, in the history of the entire universe, there has never been another one like Jesus. There is no other son of God like him. There is no other savior like him. There's no one else like Jesus. There has never been another conception like his conception. The spirit of God overshadowed a virgin named Mary and she became pregnant with the son of God. 
divinity and humanity mingled together in her womb in a way that our finite little human minds could never begin to grasp or understand. It's a good thing that heaven is for all of eternity because it is going to take us eons to really figure out and understand and grasp what happened in the incarnation that has only ever happened once in the history of the world, and it will never happen again. It was a one-shot deal. So it won't fly as an explanation for a pregnancy that needs splaining. <laughs> only Mary could get away with that one, so don't try it. Beloved, there is no other spiritual leader, there is no other prophet, there is no other God or supposed Savior that can make that same claim. Not even Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus. He is the one and only God-man born of a virgin. There is no one else like Jesus. There has never been another birth like his birth. He is the only one whose birth and life and death fulfilled more than 300 prophecies that were given hundreds of years ahead of time. He's the only one whose birth was attested by the stars in the sky. He's the only one whose birth was celebrated by the angelic hosts in the night sky. He's the only one whose birth stirred the heart of some eastern kings and terrorized the heart of a paranoid Palestinian king. Jesus, the Word, became flesh and pitched His tent among us. He tabernacled with us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. John is telling us something definitive has happened in human history. Something has happened that the world has never seen before or since. A marker has been placed in time. Something that has happened that has changed the whole course of the world and of human history. There is no one else like Jesus. There has never been another life like his life. No one else has ever lived a life of sinless perfection like him. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but not Jesus. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. The disobedience of the first Adam plunged humanity into the darkness of sin, but the perfect obedience of the second Adam, Jesus, makes many righteous. There's never been another teacher of righteousness like Jesus. No one else has ever revealed the nature of God, the heart of God, the will of God like Jesus did. There's never been another worker of miracles like him. There has never been another compassionate lover of people like Jesus. There is no one else like him. There has never been another death like his death. Never before or since. Has any other savior called by any other name laid down his own innocent life to take away the sins of the world? Why would you want to worship an ugly, hideous God who's mean and angry and has to be appeased all the time with offerings and presented gifts to keep him from playing capricious tri tricks on you? What a beautiful savior Jesus is. I am the beautiful shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes it away from me. I lay it down of my own accord, and I have the authority to lay it down and to take it up again. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and become alive to righteousness. Never before or since has anyone endured the punching and the mocking and the scourging and the crucifixion that Jesus did? Never before or since has anyone died on a cross with a crown of thorns on his head and a sign that read Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. 
Never before or since has the sky grown dark like it did when Jesus hung on the cross. Never before or since has an innocent man had the love to say, Father, forgive them. Never before or since has anyone had the authority to give up his own spirit like Jesus did at the time of the evening sacrifice on the day when the Passover lambs were being slaughtered. Beloved, John 1 tells an unfathomable love story. The eternal God, comprised of three distinct co-equal persons in one Godhood who existed in perfect, unbroken, face-to-face -face fellowship, changed his status. He became something substantively that he previously was not, and he broke that circle of perfect fellowship to save you and me. The moment that Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself, the Father looked away from the Son. And at that moment, an eternity of unbroken fellowship was shattered. Beloved Christmas and the cross cost God more than you or I could ever possibly imagine. Beyond the horrific suffering of Jesus, he himself experienced the sting of separation and death that sin causes. The author of life tasted death. And he did it so that he could open up that circle of fellowship to invite us in. Do you understand that? If you think about it for a minute, it'll make you speak in tongues that that circle of fellowship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit was broken so that it could be opened so that you and I could come in. If anybody loves me, my Father will come and we'll fellowship. We'll be in that circle of fellowship together. Never before or since did the earth quake like it quaked when Jesus died. That was some earthquake. It caused the temple, the curtain in the temple that separated man from God to be torn in half from top to bottom. That earthquake caused the tombs of holy people in Jerusalem to be broken open and dead people jumped out of their graves. How many of you know that was some kind of one of a kind earthquake? There's never been another one like Jesus. There has never been another resurrection like his resurrection. Never before or since has anyone had the authority to lay down his life and then take it up again three days later. Never before or since has any other savior called by any other name left behind an empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Never before has anyone triumphed over death and hell and the grave and the demonic powers and principalities. There is no one else like Jesus. There is no other people like his church. There is no other power like his power. There is no other glory like his glory. There has never been another savior like Jesus and there is no other name like his name. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, give God some glory in this place today. Hallelujah! 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 Come on, let's sing. Let's give him glory.
Would you bow your heads with me for just one moment this morning? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Men say all kinds of things about Jesus, but what God wants to know today is who do you say Jesus is? I wonder just before we close our service this morning if there's someone here and you've been undecided about Jesus. A decision not to make a decision about Jesus is ultimately a decision to reject him for all of eternity. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him. But to as many as did receive him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. I wonder if there's someone here today, and maybe while we've been sharing, something, a light switch flipped on in your heart. Maybe you said, you know, I, I really get it. I really understand it now. Maybe today's your day to make a decision about Jesus, to receive him, to put your trust in him. While heads are bowed all over this place, you know, I want this to be the most joyful Christmas that you've ever had. While heads are bowed all over this place, I wonder if there's someone here today and you say, today, I'd like to make a decision for Jesus. I'd like to put my trust in him. I'd like to receive him into my heart. If that's you, would you put up your hand high wherever you are? And I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. Come on, there's one. Is there someone else? Come on, I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him into my heart. There's another. Come on, is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus. Come on, church. I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him in. Come on, is there someone else? There's another. Is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him in. Thank you, Father. Let's all lift up our hands all over this place together. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. To as many as received him, to as many as believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. I'm going to lead in a prayer. I want everybody to follow after me, and we're going to help some people just really receive the true spirit joy of Christmas this morning. Come on, let's pray. I'll lead you follow. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. My life has been broken. I want to come home. I want to come back to that purpose that you created me for. Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and the leader of my life. I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord some glory in this place. Hallelujah. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, as soon as this service is over, I want to invite you to come forward. We want to meet you. We have something that we want to give you, and we just want to celebrate your decision to follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask everyone to be seated for just one moment, and uh, our service is almost through. But I just want to ask if perhaps you would join together with me in something and share in a Christmas offering for our friends in Uganda. Many of you know our friend, Pastor Jackson Senyanga. He has been our friend for over 10 years here at Harvest Time. If you've never had the privilege of hearing Pastor Jackson share the word, uh, he's just one of the most powerful uh, ministers of the word that I know. He has a struggling little church in Kampala, Uganda of 45,000 people. 
they have a stadium, a uh, soccer stadium that they fill every Friday evening with 120,000 believers and they pray all night, every Friday night. Big part of Pastor Jackson's work is an orphan's village that he has built. Um, because of the AIDS crisis in the continent of Africa, there are many orphaned children. And so what Jackson began doing a number of years ago was taking orphans and putting them together with a widow and building homes for them and making a new family for a widow and a group of about 15, 18, 20 children. Uh, this is a picture of the, if you can make it out, that's the Orphan's Village from overhead. Uh, we have built over the last 10 years, Harvest Time has built more than a dozen of these homes for widows and for orphans. And they are currently caring for feeding, clothing, and educating 1,400 children in that orphan's village. My friend Pastor Jackson came to me a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he said, Glenn, we have a need, and I just came to see whether maybe Harvest Time would be willing to help. He said that, you know, when the children are small, they're easy to feed, they're easy to clothe, they're easy to educate, but he said when they grow up and they become teenagers, he said they're a lot harder to feed, they're a lot harder to clothe, they're a lot harder to educate, and anybody with a teenager in the house would just say amen to that. And he said what a lot of the, the orphan agencies, he said what a lot of them do is when the kids turn 14, they just push them out on the street. They don't have room for them anymore. Uh, they're expensive to care for and to educate. He said it's much easier, quite frankly, it's much easier to raise money uh, for little, cute little, you know, three and four and five year olds. It's hard to raise money for teenagers. And he said that's not our vision. God gave us a vision to raise up Christian leaders to transform our nation. He said when the kids are turned out on the street, it only perpetuates the cycle of poverty. So they get in trouble, they have nowhere to go. Many of them fall victim to the sex trafficking industry. And he said, we're committed to educating our kids all the way through high school. We're committed to teaching them a trade. We're committed to uh, sending as many on to college as we can. And so they have just recently completed a high school building. I think we have a picture of the high school building. Uh, it's a four-story building, and it has room for 2,000 students. But they need to outfit the building. And they have a goal, the building's been completed, but they have a goal to outfit the building and have it ready to open for school for February 1st when the Christmas break is over in Uganda. And he said, Glenn, I need a thousand desks and chairs. And a hundred dollars will buy a desk and a chair, it'll buy a uniform, and it'll buy a school kit for a student, for one of the students from the Christian Life Village, the orphan village that we've been partners with for so many years. And so I simply want to ask today if you would be part of this offering with us. You know, Pastor Jackson came to us right in the middle of the Jump In Capital campaign. How many of you love it when God uses your own words to test you? I stood up here and I preached when God wants to bless you, he gives you an opportunity to give. And the next day, Pastor Jackson was at my door asking for an offering. And I said, oh, Jesus, everybody is given so much. They're sacrificing to give to the building. They, it's Christmas time. It's, it's a time when uh, there's so many things to take care of. How can, I, how can I put this need in front of everybody? But, you know, the Bible says true religion is to take care of the widows and the orphans in their distress. And so I simply want to ask you if you would consider taking part in a special offering today at the end of this service uh, for these orphans and to meet this need. We put a second offering envelope into your bulletin this morning, and so there's an extra offering envelope. You can use that to give. Uh, if you need an offering envelope, you can slip up a hand and the ushers will come and find you. Um, maybe you can give. There's some folks up here. There's some folks over here. If you need an offering envelope, the ushers will get to you. Maybe you can give $100. Um, maybe you can give more than $100. Uh, maybe $100 is a real stretch for you right now. 
um, with everything else that you have to do. We could put your 50 with someone else's 50 and make 100. We could put some 20s together and make 100. But I would love to see how many multiples of $100 uh, we could make together. Listen, none of this is going to Harvest Time Church. Um, I want to tell you honestly, we're giving out of our need. The snowstorms wiped us out last weekend. Um, and so it's a real sacrifice, really. Um, but we're, we're going to do this together. And so if you're making a check, make it out to Harvest Time Church. You can use the offering envelope to give by credit card or debit card, or if you want credit for giving by cash, just slip it in the envelope and write your name on the outside. While you're preparing to give, uh, the ushers are going to have plates at the back door and the back entrance, and on your way out, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to give there. Let's just sing that chorus. Come on. We'll praise your name forever. We'll praise your name forever. Sing that again. We'll praise your name forever. 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 Would you stand together with us? I want to just pray a prayer of blessing over you. I want to tell you that this is going to be the most beautiful Christmas that you've ever had because the joy of Christmas is in your heart. You're going to have a good time with your family. You've been, some of you have been dreading. I know you've been dreading. But listen, the Lord's going to heal broken relationships in your family. The Prince of Peace is going to be at your table. You're going to feel the joy of the Lord. I want to tell you 2014 is going to be the best year that you've ever had on record. God's going to come and show up and show off in your life in this coming new year. I, I say that because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Take somebody's hand next to you. Uh, we're going to pray after we pray. Um, worship team is going to sing Joy to the World. Rejoice a little bit with us. And then if you want to share in the offering, the ushers have plates at the back doors and the back entrance. God bless you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, we hope to see you 430 and 6 on Christmas Eve. Let's pray. Father, now I thank you for your people, God, and I pray, Lord, your profound blessing over each one of our families this Christmas time. Lord, I pray that, Lord, with buckets, Lord, we would draw joy from the well of salvation. I pray that the joy of Christmas would just well up and stay with us, Lord, through these next several days as we share with family and friends and with loved ones. Father, I pray that the cloud of your presence would just envelop your people. I pray that your protection would surround your people. Pray for all those in our Harvest Time family, Lord, who are traveling near and far. Lord, that you'd watch over us in the air, on the highways, Lord, everywhere we go, that angel of the Lord, you would encamp around us. Lord, I pray that your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us. Pray that your peace would encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Merry Christmas. Come on, sing joy to the world. Joy to the world. The Lord is. Bow your heads with me for just one moment this morning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Men say all kinds of things about Jesus, but what God wants to know today is who do you say Jesus is? I wonder just before we close our service this morning if there's someone here and you've been undecided about Jesus. A decision not to make a decision about Jesus is ultimately a decision to reject him for all of eternity. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him. But to as many as did receive him, 
to those who believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. I wonder if there's someone here today, and maybe while we've been sharing something, a light switch flipped on in your heart. Maybe you said, you know, I, I really get it. I really understand it now. Maybe today's your day to make a decision about Jesus, to receive him, to put your trust in him. While heads are bowed all over this place, you know, I want this to be the most joyful Christmas that you've ever had. While heads are bowed all over this place, I wonder if there's someone here today to say, today, I'd like to make a decision for Jesus. I'd like to put my trust in him. I'd like to receive him into my heart. If that's you, would you put up your hand high wherever you are? And I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. Come on, there's one. Is there someone else? Come on, I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him into my heart. There's another. Come on, is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus. Come on, church. I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him in. Come on, is there someone else? There's another. Is there someone else? I want to receive Jesus. I want to invite him in. Thank you, Father. Let's all lift up our hands all over this place together. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. To as many as received him, to as many as believed on his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. I'm going to lead in a prayer. I want everybody to follow after me. And we're going to help some people just really receive the true spirit joy of Christmas this morning. Come on, let's pray. I'll lead you follow. Father. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, confess with my mouth. Jesus, is Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, need you. I, need your I need your forgiveness. My life has been broken. Has been broken. I want to come home. I want to come, I, I come back to that purpose, to that, purpose. That, you that you created me for. Jesus, Jesus. I receive you I receive as my you. Lord and the leader of my life, I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord some glory in this place. Hallelujah. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, as soon as this service is over, I want to invite you to come forward. We want to meet you. We have something that we want to give you, and we just want to celebrate your decision to follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask everyone, would you stand together with us? I want to just pray a prayer of blessing over you. I want to tell you that this is going to be the most beautiful Christmas that you've ever had because the joy of Christmas is in your heart. You're going to have a good time with your family. You've been, some of you have been dreading. I know you've been dreading. But listen, the Lord's going to heal broken relationships in your family. The Prince of Peace is going to be at your table. You're going to feel the joy of the Lord. I want to tell you 2014 is going to be the best year that you've ever had on record. God's going to come and show up and show off in your life in this coming new year. I, I say that because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Take somebody's hand next to you. Uh, we're going to pray after we pray. Um, worship team is going to sing Joy to the World. Rejoice a little bit with us. And then if you want to share in the offering, the ushers have plates at the back doors and the back entrance. God bless you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, we hope to see you 430 and 6 on Christmas Eve. Let's pray. Father, now I thank you for your people, God. And I pray, Lord, your profound blessing over each one of our families this Christmas time. Lord, I pray that, Lord, with buckets, Lord, we would draw joy from the well of salvation. I pray that the joy of Christmas would just well up and stay with us, Lord, through these next several days as we share with family and friends and with loved ones. Father, I pray that the cloud of your presence would just envelop your people. I pray that your protection would surround your people. Pray for all those in our Harvest Time family, Lord, who are traveling 
and near and far. Lord, that you'd watch over us in the air, on the highways, Lord, everywhere we go. That angel of the Lord, you would encamp around us. Lord, I pray that your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us. Pray that your peace would encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Merry Christmas. Come on, sing joy to the world. Joy.